Some call me Steve, Dad, Husband or Friend. Others might call me Boss, Coach or Mentor. Today you can call me the Leadership Hacker. Thanks for listening in, I really appreciate it. My job as the Leadership Hacker is to hack into the minds, experiences, habits and learning of great leaders, C-suite executives, authors and development experts so that I can assist you developing your understanding and awareness of leadership. I'm Steve Rush and I'm your host today. I'm the author of Leadership Cake. I'm a transformation consultant and leadership coach and can't wait to start sharing all things leadership with you. Terry Earthwind Nichols is the guest on today's show. He's the founder and chairman of The Evolutionary Healer. He's a top thought leader and the author of Profiling for Profit, What Crossed Arms Don't Tell You. But before we get a chance to speak with Terry, it's a Leadership Hacker News. There's so much bad press and so much terrible news happening across the world right now. I'm pivoting today to tell you a story. And it was first told to me by my friend and guest on episode 4, Michael G. Rogers. This is a story about unintended consequences of leadership communication. Once there was a group of frogs merrily hopping through the forest. They didn't have a care in the world until two of the frogs fell into a deep pit. All of the other frogs gathered round quickly around this large pit, peered down into its deep vastness. They began to scratch their heads trying to come up with a way to help. After a long period of time, they couldn't think of any solution, so they all agreed it was hopeless and yelled down to the other two frogs to prepare for their fate. It was unlikely that it would ever get out. Unwilling to believe this, the other two frogs started to jump and jump and jump. The group of frogs above began to shout, it was time to give up, you're never gonna win. It's time to quit, you're never gonna get out of here. After a period of time, One of the two frogs in the deep pit gave heed to what was being said to him. He gave up and sadly died. The other frog, however, kept jumping even higher and higher. The shouts of discouragement continued and got louder. And even though it was absolutely drained, every last bit of energy this last remaining frog had continued to jump even higher. And in a miraculous last jump, eventually jumped so high he sprang out of the pit. The other frogs celebrated the frog's crazy victory gathered around him in puzzlement. They said, didn't you hear us tell you to stay down there, that you'd never get out? In response, the frog said, oh, that's what you were saying. I'm hard of hearing. And I thought you were telling me to jump higher. And I thought you weren't discouraging me, but actually encouraging me. And I guess there are two leadership parallels to the story. Many people in your life and work and your role as a leader, including your self-talk, by the way, will tell you things are too hard give up. Don't try harder. Make the choice not to listen to negative self-talk and negative talk from others. And positivity breeds positivity. As a leader, you can unlock mindsets that shape thinking and develop positive behaviours, and it's so much more fun being positive than being negative, right? So take this as an opportunity to inspire people. Don't suppress even what you think might be as impossible, and let them unlock their greatness that's been a leadership hacking news if you have any stories news or insights please get in touch our special guest on today's show is terry earthwind nichols terry is the chairman of the evolutionary healer he's a thought leader and author of the book profiling for profit what crossed arms don't tell you terry welcome to the leadership hacker podcast thank you steve i'm glad to be here So before we get into some of the really interesting work that you are undertaking with your teams at the moment, just tell us a little bit about the backstory as to maybe your early career and how you arrived at uh, leading the business that you do now. Well, it's been an interesting run, I'll tell you. Um, I graduated from high school. I I was born and raised in the uh, upper western area of the United States in the mountains of the Rocky Mountains. So you might say I'm a, a mountain boy, so to speak. And when I graduated from high school, uh, I didn't quite make the uh, financial grade to go straight into college. Uh, Vietnam War was still going uh, back in 1971. And so uh, my best bet was to join the Navy and see the world. That's exactly what I did for 20 years. I uh, 
loved it. It was a great experience. Uh, wouldn't trade it for anything. We can talk about that a little bit later. Um, but I have been a lifelong helper. I, you know, my nickname in high school was Doc Nick. People come and talk to me and tell me their problems. So, <laughs> you know, my, my future life uh, had started very early. I just never knew it. Some 40 years later after high school, going on 50 here next year, um, I, I started helping some people again uh, through an international ministry called uh, the Stephen Ministry. It's a one-on-one -on -one crisis intervention ministry. And I was helping a person from my, my apartment in uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota, in the upper Midwest of the United States. And uh, she was out in Australia. And um, one night I just I, I was helping her, but we weren't weren't getting very far as far as, you know, um, really moving forward to what what her issues were. And I got this hit to have her close her eyes and that's shutting off all the visual around her and just ask her what her smell, because I knew from uh, my leadership classes in the Navy and stuff like that first aid classes that smells the number one trigger for uh, memory recall. And so I asked her what she smelled and, and she said, oh my God, gas. And I go, okay, what kind? Diesel, gasoline, what do you got? She said, no, natural gas. This is an all electric building, so there must be a fire. And I go, well, somehow the second before, you didn't smell anything the second before I asked you. How about just taking a few deep breaths, close your eyes again, and see if you can smell that gas again? And she was able to. And I said, go back and find a memory where you smell that gas. And she did. And so what we now have trademarked as repetitive behavior cellular regression had begun. After about three to five hours a week over the course of about three months, the first CR session, that's what we call it, CR process session, had was completed and we've now got that down to a couple of three hours so it's a lot quicker and easier for uh us to work with our clients um, as a matter of fact we work in clients in 13 countries in five languages now wow. so that was 10 years ago so what started out with some help for somebody that you were talking to has now turned into your life's work because the evolutionary healer you now run is basically set up to help people through that regression and making sure that, that people are in a good place for the future. Tell us a little bit about what you do now. Well, Evolutionary Healer started out as a mom and pop operation. My wife and I uh, started it out with health and wellness uh, people and taken uh, them through the CR process as the first part of coaching with them. And then we were able to, to um, our coaches said, why aren't you teaching this? This isn't woo woo or anything like that. You have a, a solid question and answer sequence. And so we started teaching it. And so the Earthwind Academy was born and uh, we still have the Earthwind Academy going. And then, um, you know, it expanded out. Um, my wife's an author, so she, as a matter of fact, she just finished her memoir, which is her 20th book, uh, just this last month. And um, she started working with, with people to, to um, write a book and self-publish it in 30 days over Amazon. And uh, that's turned into quite a, quite a business. So now we've had three divisions there. And... I started working with imposter syndrome. Imposter syndrome is wild, crazy sure is, out yeah. there in the executive world. Mm. Uh, they, they estimate 70% uh, based on, on my conversations and my work with uh, CEOs and senior executives. Uh, uh, that's probably 85%, if not higher, uh, out there. And so... Um, the consortium was born, uh, the fourth of our four divisions of evolutionary healer now in just eight years, we've, we've gotten a lot, we're getting pretty wide, uh, with practitioners in, in, uh, eight countries of so 45 of them. And so, um, the consortium division is, uh, working with, with executives in, in global fortune, uh, 1000 companies. And we work with them with uh, vision strategy and and 
uh, a lot the, a lot of other things, but the, the imposter syndrome was a big piece of that puzzle. So uh, evolutionary healer has really evolved. Evolutionary is illum, uh, eve of illumination or, or coming out or seeing something new. And healer is a little more, more than what people average think. Healer is to heal, heal oneself and to move forward and to evolve. So Evolutionary Healer was born based on that premise. Great. It's a great backstory. And imposter syndrome as high as kind of 80% in organizations is really stark. In your experience, Terry, what is it that causes that? Well, the same thing that causes uh, PTSD, uh, suicide ideation, uh, lifelong self-sabotage, all those things. What we found was the answer to what Dr. Sigmund Freud was looking for back in the late 1890s. He was a German psychi a psychiatrist uh, that was working with people to try and find a memory of high emotional value in early childhood. Well, um, we found a way to help a person uh, using their five senses to inventory a single memory one at a time. We, we help them find an amnesic memory in early childhood, usually pre-language, that uh, has a high emotional value to that child at that moment. And because they're pre-language, they, they can't go to mom and dad and say, you know, this just, I just saw this happen or this just happened and I don't understand it. So what happens is there's a natural uh, protection device uh, in our brains called amnesia. And amnesia takes over to protect us from that remembering that uh, memory. And as we grow, uh, it starts uh, watching and protecting us in various ways. Uh, so that later on in life, when more significant emotional events occur uh, in whether we see them or or they actually occur to us, the the protection system keeps us thinking about those things. And then the repetitive behavior sets in. And it's like being on a uh, merry-go-round without being able to shut it off. Got it. That's the so that's how that works. And therefore, what manifests itself in our more mature years in our adult life, in your experience, has been created much, much, much earlier. Correct. And it's driven by that. So when they find, when we help them go back uh, using an alternate neural pathway, because the, the, the protection device, the active block, this amnesia, has cut off the, the neural pathway back to that memory and is protecting it. So we literally, by using the five senses, we go back to the back and bottom of the brain near the stem where the five senses um, are and move forward. So we literally come in the back door with the client uh, into a memory that they have not been to since it happened. And the, the, the memory itself is crystal clear as if it happened two minutes ago. It's unbelievable how, how, uh, a memory back so far in early childhood can be remembered uh, with such clarity. It's, it's quite amazing. Now, here's the key to this, Steve. When that's found and we neutralize the emotions of that memory, all of the other stuff they can't stop thinking about, they stop thinking about. PTSD is shut off. Uh, suicide ideation is shut off. The imposter syndrome thoughts are all shut off and they don't come back because we teach our clients how to um, recognize new problems coming in and neutralize it before they take hold. Does that make sense? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, that's how it works. Given the vast amount of experiences that you've had, maybe you could share with our listeners one of the perhaps the most vivid experiences that you've shared with one of your clients. Yeah, there was, there was, um, we observe, we, we go through the CR process session using Zoom or, or Skype or some audio visual. And, uh, we've used and used a video on, on Facebook before. Uh, but, uh, we watch them because, and this is where the book came from, because I've been a lifelong people watcher. And when we first started out in the business, our clients were live in the room with us when we took them through the, uh, the process. And we would observe different things that would happen physically as we were getting close to this memory and the person responsible for the memory. And one that was that uh, was just utterly amazing 
if you've ever tried to take a pinky toe and fold it over like you're crossing your fingers, fold it over your fourth toe, it's impossible. But I've had three uh, different clients uh, in different, different times be able to take that pinky toe and cross it over the fourth toe when they were talking about or describing a, a person of high emotional value that we found out later was per, a, a perpetrator of various uh, different means. That was an amazing thing to observe. Another time I was uh, in the room person to person with a lady who did not move for an hour and a half, not a muscle. She didn't move her face, didn't twinkle her eyes, not anything. She was like a hunk of stone. All of a sudden, uh, we were talking about her grandfather and she was explaining uh, her senses in a memory. She had dangling earrings. And for anybody that knows dangling earrings, if the left one moves, the right one moves too. They both go at the same time. All right. This one, this time, the left earring started to moving with, without moving the right ear, earring. It was amazing. So there was just, you know, the different things that we observed uh, going through these processes is just mind blowing, you know, and uh, they're indicators of where we're going to be when we get to the end of that uh, third memory. It's pretty amazing. And your fascination with people watching is what caused you to have the inspiration behind the book, which is all about how you've learned through observation to how you profile people's behaviors, right? Tell us a little bit about how the book came about. Well, the book came about because my practitioners and my business partner, my wife, uh, bugged me for almost two years to write the book uh, because I know so much. You know, I've been a people watcher all my life. And when I was overseas uh, in Europe and I would I would uh, get off uh, my Navy ship and I, I would go and find me a sidewalk cafe whenever possible. And I'd sit there and have my cappuccinos. I love cappuccinos. And um, I would just watch people, not from a scientific or behavioral standpoint. I just watch them and how they, you know, react to certain stresses, you know, that that were obvious when when uh, uh, I would be observing them. And then, you know, these, these oddities that in, in muscle movements um, associated with our CR process, I've personally taken 147 people through this process in the last 10 years. And, and so you, you learn that there are certain things that the body does at, at a time that is completely subconscious movement. And so the book came from uh, all of those observations. Right. In old language, you might have heard the term body language or nonverbal communication, which you, you substitute for the word profiling, right? So tell us a little bit about the whole kind of principle, what crossed arms don't tell you, because ultimately the old thinking behind body language was if you had your arms crossed, you were either hiding something or you were negative, but you debunk that theory, don't you? Yes, I did. And, and, and there's nothing wrong with body language. It's over a thousand books in, in print in the English language alone on body language and how to read it. For almost all of it that I have observed, it's pretty accurate. The, the thing that, that they don't go into in any of the w books that I've read, and I've read, I don't know, over 50, they don't talk about variables to, to, uh, the way a person moves or crosses their legs or their arms or whatever uh, with the, the, the situation that they're in. Case in point, a woman was talking to me at a networking event one time. Uh, she crossed her eyes, arms, and, um, you know, it was continued the conversation, uh, which is basically a no buy for salespeople. Cross your arms, you're done. Uh, but she was cold. Okay. So it wasn't she, that she wasn't buying or receiving the message that I was giving her. It was just cold in the room. So there are circumstances, environmental and otherwise, uh, that, that, uh, we subconsciously do. Uh, the, the, for instance, uh, crossing your arms, uh, can be a security thing. You know, it's not that I am no longer in a no buy situation. It's just, um, you're you're touching on stuff that 
that I'm uncomfortable with. So crossing my arms, as I was taught when I was a kid, when mom and dad got mad at me, they crossed their arms. So uh, when this person's talking to me and, and uh, I'm hitting a couple of buttons, emotional buttons, they'll cross their arms for protection, not per se, uh, no buy. So, you know, the way people tilt their head left or right means different things as well. And the way people uh, talk on the phone, and in the book, I talk about online, uh, how to look at different things in emails and, and in phone conversations and that type of thing. So all of these are just providing you with little clues and hints to give you some insight as to how somebody's reacting, right? Absolutely. Got it. You know, how they talk to me with their arms crossed, the whole thing. I have a cute story in there. I was selling custom clothes shortly after getting out of the Navy and, and uh, there was a man in front of me in my customs clothing store that I worked at, you know, and we'd already talked and looked at some fabrics and things like that. And so uh, we were both standing uh, facing each other and he, he had his arms crossed. And, and so, you know, I'm in the process of, of telling him how we're going to make the suit and, and how it's done and all that. And he, his arms are crossed. He dropped his head down to the left and I stopped talking for about a half a second. And I said, so how do you want to pay for this? And he says, oh, visa's good. I said, okay, let's sit down and let's, let's get a deposit and start uh, designing your suit. Okay. So a couple of minutes later, all of a sudden he sits back in his chair and he says, wait a minute. I go, you have a question? And he says, yeah, I'm standing in front of you. I am a professional salesman. I make $2 million deals all over the United States every month. Okay, I'm standing in front of you, giving you a no buy sign across my arms, and you closed me. How did you know I was ready to buy the suit? And I go, well, both of your feet were parallel and you were facing me full on. That means neutral. Uh, your arms are crossed. Don't mean anything to me because as soon as you dropped your head down and to the left, that told me you were trusting me and you were confident in what I was saying. And it was time to, to close the deal. And he looks for, at me for another second or two, and he sh kind of shakes his head left and right, and he says, well, I'll be darned. Okay, so what do we do next? And he bought my first $2,000 suit sale. Great. <laughs> Excellent. And if I'm a leader listening to this, Terry, there must be a, a bunch of things that present themselves regularly with my team and maybe with, our, with my customers and clients. What would be the, the kind of top things that you notice that present themselves as clues that we can be looking out for? Well, the biggest thing is if you were to dissect a person vertically, right down the middle of their body, anything that's movement-wise on the left side or the heart side of the body is confidence, love, trust, all of those things. Now, if, you, if you've ever picked up a baby who's crying or whatever, where do you put it? On the left side of your body over your heart so that you're heart to heart. That's the love nurture side, okay? Now, if they start to move and movements or tilt their head to the right, that's defense or, or distrust or confusion, okay? So if, if in body language, for instance, if a person is lying to you, they have a tendency to look down and to the right right side. Okay. And where do we get left and right? Well, left side is the nurturing side. But another thing to, to think about is back in the Roman times, they taught everybody to carry a sword or a weapon in the right hand and a defense device, a shield or something in the left hand, so that all of the soldiers were exactly the same. That way they didn't cut each other when they were standing beside each other. And so the natural deflection of since, you know, the last 20 or more thousand years out there has to been to be, uh, fight, flight, or freeze is to the right to run away and those kinds of things if possible. So knowing the left side of the body and the right side of the body is uh, very important uh, to remember when you're doing that. How fast uh, are they talking to you on the phone? How fast or slow? Cadence of, the, of how they speak is very important. Somebody who's talking very fast could be an ethnic thing, or they could be just nervous, or they're trying to figure out get, how to get out of this conversation. There's a lot of cultures where, where their cadence is quicker, so you just attune yourself, your ears to those cadence. In, a, in an email, for instance, are they uh, long, casual sentences, or are they short and to the point and is it a short email? Somebody trying to get this email off their inbox, 
or are they really trying to communicate with you? So all of that's in the book as well. Excellent. So there's lots of hints and tips that uh, folk can get into uh, if they get a copy of the book, right? Oh, yeah. When I, you know, COVID's kind of, kind of messed us up a little bit. I've had some fun on, on webinars. I did a webinar for uh, Sales and Marketing Executive International. We had about 1,121 people on that one. That was a lot of fun. But, but we, you know, when I'm live, I have little things that we do with the audience that, that's kind of fun. You know, uh, uh, makes it interesting. That's for Great. sure. So this part of the show, Terry, we're going to turn the leadership lens back on you. So you've led teams for many, many years in different guises and in different shapes. So we want to hack into that leadership thinking that sits with you. And therefore, Terry, could you just share with us what would be your top three leadership hacks? Listen attentively. Okay. The person in front of you uh, is communicating with you. And I teach this in my coaching that message is everything. Okay. If the person is not receiving you, uh, a good way to to understand that they are or are not receiving you is to ask a simple question. For you, those of you who are listening, write this down. The question is, does that make sense? Does that make sense? Solicit 97% of the time, the person is going to respond audibly with the word yes. The other 3%, they have questions or, or they're going to say no. And if they say no, normally, uh, more than three quarters of the time, they're going to say no, but I have a question. Okay. Does that make sense is huge. Now, here's what does that make sense do for you as a person who's maybe selling something to somebody? You give them permission to hear themselves say yes out loud two or three times by asking that question uh, during the course of the conversation, then when it's time to propose a buying situation, they're more inclined to say yes. It's a powerful question. The last of the three is put yourself in their position. Okay, if somebody comes to you with an issue, uh, what would you do if you were the person standing there explaining it to your boss what what it is? And did something happen to you or with you or around you in your experience that could be of high value to that person at this point in time that may or may not be according to the general rules of the company? So those are, those would be the three things that, that I think are the greatest. Does that make sense? It makes sense to me, Terry. That's great advice. And interestingly, that in your last hack there, you know, we don't often spend time stepping into the shoes of other people or seeing it from other perspectives. You know, perspective is really, really important, isn't it, to understand how others think, feel, and behave too. Yes. Uh, you know, there's an old saying, I'm, I'm Chickamauga Cherokee, Native American by blood. And uh, there's, a, there's a great saying that they use. It's called a teaching. And it, and it is uh, simply, you cannot give what you do not have. If you're not getting respect, that means you're not giving it. You got to give it first and then it'll come back to you. Okay. Yeah. And there's a, there's a, a story in the book there about uh, my best custom clothing client came to me from uh, a kid who washed my car uh, in the parking garage of the building uh, of then Pillsbury corporate headquarters. I go upstairs, I do my work with the, the top floor executives, come down. I'd always talk to the young kid. Uh, Pete was his name. And one time he, he says, you know, he asked me, why do you, you know, you always dress so well. I know you go up to the top floor and stuff like that. That's why I wash your car. But, you know, you always dress so well, not like a regular corporate person. What do you do? Now, there's two things I could have done. I could have just said, yeah, you know, I'm not, I just uh, I'm sell stuff to them upstairs. No, you know, no big deal. But I respected the kid. He gave me a, a genuine question. He deserves a genuine answer. I gave him a full spill of what I do as a custom clothing salesman. And he said, that's really cool. I bet my uncle could, could benefit from, from you making suits. And, and I go, well, here, here's my card. Sometime when you see your uncle, tell him about what I do. So about a week later, this is cool, Steve. I get a call in the middle of the morning. And there's this guy on the other side. He says, uh, "So you you sell you sell suits? I got I got your I got your name from my my nephew Petey. He was over having dinner last night, and he, he was telling me how how good you look in your in your suits and stuff. How do you do that?" And I said, "Well, I come to offices and blah blah blah. I gave him the same spill that I give to Petey 
uh, before. And he says, well, I want to come and see. I, I, I have a tough time uh, getting suits off the rack. Almost impossible. And I hate traveling to New York. We were in Minneapolis at the time. I hate traveling to New York all the time uh, and spend a week or two there to get my each season's clothes. And I said, okay, so I'll come out. This guy turned out to be my best customer, highest pay, uh, sales customer of all of them. And he came from Pete, the guy who washed my cars. So ladies and gentlemen, respect is everything. Yeah, it just goes to show, doesn't it, that, you know, Everybody you speak to has a backstory and has also connections that can help you in your life and work, right? Yeah. The guy was executive vice president at the time of one of the top uh, banks in the, in the world. Awesome. Right? So this, this guy was no little guy. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So Terry, this part of the show also we call Hack to Attack. So this is where we've maybe had something not work out as well in our past. Maybe something's gone a little awry or maybe even screwed up. But as a result of that experience, we've now used that in our life and our work as a positive outcome. What would be your hack to attack? I've messed up so many times. It's it's unbelievable. And I continue to. And I think that's part of the journey because, you know, uh, a journey is not a guided tour. And neither is life. I mean, you either succeed in life or you learn. And when I'm teaching vision strategy to, to uh, my clients, I teach them that when they achieve something, they not only celebrate the achievement, but they take a minute and, and reflect on what did they learn. Because just about any project you can come up with, things go wrong. That's just the way it works. And what did you learn from it? And what can you take with you as you move forward? So what would have been your biggest learn in your career so far? Uh, I learned it the hard way. And that is shut up and listen. When I was a, a young buck, uh, probably as, as late as my, my middle 40s, I felt that I always had to have something to say rather than just be quiet and listen and respond if, it, if, if there was something to actually say uh, rather than respond to respond. And uh, that was a hard lesson. I, I got fired a few times because I would do that stuff. And, and now I make sure that my clients don't do that. Yep. Right. And it's important, isn't it? That whatever happens, whatever goes wrong, that we absolutely use it as a lesson and we use it as a, as a learning experience rather than we see it as a failure. Right. Yeah. And, and, you know, there's very few failures, uh, or, or things that have gone wrong and, and, and lessons that I did not get a chance to use in a positive way later on in life. Sure. So, you know, you take it with you and, and you keep it handy. And the last thing we want to do is to do a bit of time travel with you. So we affectionately ask our guests at this time to think about bumping into Terry when he was 21. And if you had a chance, Terry, to bump into your 21-year-old self, what would be the advice you'd give him? <laughs> oh, Lord. <laughs> I'm 67 years old, and that 21, I love it. When I was 21, uh, I had just re-enlisted for the first time in the Navy, and I got a little bit of re-enlistment money, and I went out and I bought a brand new a uh, Volkswagen Super Beetle. Now, Super Beetle was a little bigger than a regular Beetle of its time, uh -huh. and it had air conditioning. Ah, I lived in uh, uh, Yuma, Arizona, was where I was stationed at the time. It got very hot there, so some air conditioning in a car was kind of nice. And I would tell myself, don't put the stickers on the car. Now, there, there's, the, there's the hack right there, because... I put some stickers on the paint of my car and it gets hot there. So the um, adhesive on the stickers um, um, kind of melted into the paint. So later when we heated them up with a blow dryer and pulled them off, it took the paint with it. Oh, my God. Oh dear. It cost me a paint job to sell my car. So... Don't put the stickers on the car. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it sounds to me that that's still a really painful experience when you look back on it. Oh, I can see the the paint pulled away on my on the bumpers of my car. The 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 stickers were funny, and you know when you're young, you do things without really stopping to think it through, and that was one of them. That was one of them. So yeah, don't put those stickers on the car. There's always a consequence, right? <laughs> 
Yeah. There's always a consequence behind every action. Yes, there is. <laughs> Excellent stuff. So, Terry, for those people that are listening today who'd like to learn more about how profiling for profit can help them or more about the work that you do uh, with the Evolutionary Healer, where's the best place that they can find out more about your work? I'd say Google. Here's why. I have a brand that's unique in the world, Terry Earthwind Nichols. Earthwind is my tribal name. I'm Cherokee, remember? And there's probably 20,000 Terry Nichols in North America alone. So to keep from having to remember all websites and all those kinds of things, Google me on, uh, and as Terry Earthwind Nichols, and you get my YouTube channels, my various companies, all my social media sites, all of it right there for you, and how to get, even how to get a hold of me. Excellent stuff. And we'll make sure also that through your social media sites and a link to the book will be in our show notes so folk can click in and find you through our site too. Great. So Terry, just from my perspective, it's been really fascinating listening to you and clearly being a lifetime watcher hasn't stopped for you. And I know that you, you with a passion, this is something that you continually evolve and continually teach. Uh, and it's been great listening to some of those stories with us today. So Terry, thanks for being on the Leash Packer podcast. Hey, I, it was great to, to be on here, Steve. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you, Terry. I genuinely want to say a heartfelt thanks for taking time out of your day to listen in too. We do this in the service of helping others and spreading the word of leadership. Without you listening in, there would be no show. So please subscribe now if you haven't done so already. Share this podcast with your communities and network and help us develop a community and a tribe of leadership hackers. And finally, if you'd like me to work with your senior team, your leadership community, keynote an event, or you would like to sponsor an episode, please connect with us via our social media. And you can do that by following and liking our pages on Twitter and Facebook. Our handle there is at Leadership Hacker. Instagram, you can find us there at the underscore leadership underscore hacker. And at YouTube, we're just Leadership Hacker. So that's me signing off. I'm Steve Rush, and I've been the Leadership Hacker. Thank you.